schedule here. There, there may be more folks filtering in from the other sessions, but I'd like to uh, start this session on cybersecurity showdown challenges and strategies for states. I'm Representative Max Tyler from Colorado, and I'll be moderating our program. Uh, before we begin, I want to say that we have live streaming for this session with the help of the Ohio channel. We'll welcome to those of you who are viewing online. I'm sure there are like thousands and hundreds of thousands of people out there watching this online, just as the people that watch your committee hearings online in, in your different sessions. So this will be recorded and made available on the Ohio channel website for viewing on demand after the meeting. Since the camera will be live throughout the session, I'd like to remind all of our panelists to please speak into the microphone, right? For those of you in the audience, if you would like to ask a question at the end of our program, please use the microphone in the center or the sides of the room. Now, cyber security threats, as we've heard a lot over the last few weeks, have enormous implications for government security, economic prosperity, and public safety. Today's session will inform you about the major cybersecurity challenges facing our country today and explain some of the strategies and collaborative efforts being developed to combat these threats. You know, I, I have come lately to the issue of cybersecurity. I had for a number of years, this was maybe 10 years ago, a file server sitting on the internet, completely unprotected, uh, with a static IP address, which means it was findable. And I found back then that it took about a minute and a half for FTP to be compromised and maybe half an hour for SQL Server to be compromised, but people didn't get much beyond that. Today, though, when we have an environment where there's literally hundreds of thousands of attacks out there, um, what I did then was folly, and what I, if I were to do it now, would be even more foolish to do. And there's a lot of attacks that are going on on our states, on our cities, and even sitting on your desk, uh, there are attacks going on, and it's going to be a real issue over the next few years to deal with that. We have a very distinguished panel today to uh, present, and I'll introduce them briefly. Our first speaker today will be Andy Bachman, a senior cyber and energy security strategist, stra strategist if I can pronounce that word for Idaho National Labs, National Homeland Security. Uh, prior to joining INL, he founded a strategic energy sector security consulting firm, was an advisor on energy security matters at the Chertoff Group in Washington, D.C., and was a security lead for IBM's global energy and utilities business. A frequent speaker, standards developer, and advisor on topics of the intersection of grid modernization and security, Mr. Bachman has provided expert testimony and analysis on energy sector security standards and gaps in federal, state, local groups, and state utility commissions. He's testified to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and on security readiness and smart grid interoperability standards and on the security and privacy readiness of AMI and smart meter systems at the Massachusetts grid modernization hearings. He has also been a contributor or author to various cybersecurity guides position papers, reports, and articles, and I think from that bio you can get the idea he is definitely on the front edge of cybersecurity protection for all aspects of our economy. Andy? Thank you, Max. That, was, uh, that bio, bio was so long it almost left no time for, for any other words. Can I, um, can I put uh, the, my slides up here? Okay. I'm going to put my slides up here. It's going to take a second. And I'll use that microphone. If it seems like I'm screwing this up, if someone who's more adept uh, can, can come to my rescue, I'd appreciate it. Calling in the cavalry. I'd help you. I'm no longer with the FBI. Though, so. Understood. <laughs> Beautifully and briskly done. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks everybody for attending. I understand we're on the very tail end of a multi-day conference, so I appreciate you bringing whatever level of energy and uh, interest remains in you after so many days. Uh, hopefully the topic is one of enough concern to you that it 
still keeps you keep, keeps you locked on. I'm uh, happy to be a member of this panel, and thanks to uh, to Max for that uh, warm introduction. Um, I'm going to tell you a couple things, let you know where my comments are coming from. They're only supposed to be 10 minutes long, so I'm going to be super brief, and maybe mm -hmm. we'll hit other points on Q&A or later on if you want to. But I'm going to basically cover the whole world here in 10 minutes, uh, organized this way. So I'm going to say very little about where I'm from. Suffice to say, uh, I'm part of the DOE National Lab Complex. If you haven't seen it or been familiar with it, there's 17 of these labs, most of them born around just before, during, or after World War II and they contain uh, tremendous scientific research and development uh, resources that are leveraged for the country, for national security, for energy security, for all kinds of related things. I'm attached to the one in Idaho, which has a particular uh, cluster of uh, professionals and experts who focus on control systems, industrial control systems, the security and resilience of which is fundamental to the security and reliability of the electric grid, uh, to the way the Department of Defense works, and to the way other, other critical infrastructure, lifeline infrastructure sectors operate. So that's why I'm there. I'm based in Boston. I'm in DC a lot, so I'm getting around. But just so you know, these are a resource that can be something that state level folks can take advantage of too. And certainly, if you're not sure how to enter that system, to try to, because it, it's spread out and overwhelming, uh, at the last slide here, there's contact information for me. I welcome any of you to follow up uh, for, any, for any reason. Um, I'm not even going to talk about this. Just look at the slide for a second. See it? See the mountains? This is where uh, 52 nuclear test reactors were built. This is where a lot of the control system security work that I described has been going on for quite some time. It's becoming a center of the universe on that topic. Uh, and it's where I just saw in the press this morning, I think the 53rd test reactor uh, built by New Scale, a small modular reactor is, is officially announced that it's going to be built on this, on this range. Okay, so the main points I'm going to talk to you about today are going to be Ukraine, uh, lessons from Ukraine, and then a couple other uh, topics for you, and then my, my buzzer will go off, right? So you've heard of this, right? December 23rd, there was a blackout. It's really the first one officially uh, caused uh, completely by cyber means. And though it happened just before Christmas, though it affected 250,000 uh, customers in Ukraine, um, it was uh, short-lived. So by outage standards, it wasn't uh, tremendously damaging. And yet, it's, we, we've expected this for some time, or at least we've been guarding against this for some time and preparing for it. Here, here is a real-world case. Didn't affect the United States directly, uh, but it, there are lots of lessons that have come out of it. All right, so I'm just in, in short order. Uh, it happened on December 23rd, uh, but it started in the spring. And that we know because of the forensics activity that was performed by uh, a couple of very close colleagues of mine uh, who've been to Ukraine twice since the incident, since the blackout happened. Um, they learned that the the government officials in Ukraine and the utility operators did a tremendous mm -hmm. job. They did, the, they did what we think is an outstanding job responding to this event. The part that's not outstanding and that, um, you know, played a role in the event happening in the first place is that the adversaries, and we don't say who the adversaries are, uh, the adversaries were clearly in the systems and starting to learn and do surveillance and move around uh, spring of that year. So there's a lot of groundwork being laid, and it was being done without anyone noticing it. And that's something for the U.S. electric sector and all other critical infrastructures to be aware of uh, these days, since official reports are, they vary, but generally speaking, it takes many months, hundreds of days for most uh, breaches, meaning when someone successfully penetrated the defenses of an organization, to even be detected. And all that time is free time for the adversary, whether, in, whether they're a nation state, a criminal, or some other type of person uh, or organization, to just basically stake out, uh, map out the lay of the land, and insert things that they want to use later on. Okay? Uh, without being too technical, I made a, uh, I want you to, um, if you bring these uh, lessons back to your state, to your public utility commission, um, there were a number of uh, recommendations, things that Ukraine could have done better that would have either prevented or at least slowed down or lessened the impact of the attack. 
and the place that I'll point you to is, uh, it's non-governmental, it's a training organization called the SANS Institute, S-A-N-S -S Institute, and they published a thing called a defense use case, or a duck, on Ukraine. And it's uh, basically a top to bottom report, non-classified, on everything that we've learned that could be shared and uh, recommendations for utilities. Why is this, and so uh, if you have a hard time finding that, um, just, just write me, I'll send it right to you, or we'll publish it somehow related to this. Again, Sands Institute, defense use case on Ukraine. Why does this matter to you? Well, the targets of the attack were Oblenergos, that's Ukrainian for distribution utility. Distribution is the level of uh, voltage that's been stepped down from high voltage transmission. High voltage transmission runs from the generation sources across many miles, goes down to get stepped down in transformers, and it becomes distribution level electricity. And these three utilities uh, were the ones that were targeted. When you think about distribution utilities, those are the ones that take the electricity into the cities, to our cities and to our towns. These are also the ones in the United States that are not covered, with a few exceptions, by the NERC SIPs. You've heard of the NERC SIPs, perhaps? These are mandatory security controls for the bulk electric system, which means big generation, big transmission, big control centers. The most important parts, arguably, of the grid, however, leaves all the rest of it, which is really all the most of it, uh, un uncovered by anything mandatory. So the attack on Ukraine was attack on the type of utilities and the types of equipment and systems that states are responsible for and the public utility commissions are responsible for. That's why I'm talking to you about it and interested in following up if you want to know more or do something about it. I think I'm going to have used up most of my time, so I'm going to skip just really quickly through a couple topics. I want to leave ample time for other folks, other speakers, and then certainly for Q&A afterwards. Two significant gov pro government programs that uh, could have an impact on utilities in your state and hopefully will have a positive impact are CRISP, that's a Department of Energy program, uh, Cybersecurity Risk Information Sharing Program, I'll tell you more about it afterwards, no time now, and GridX is an exercise that happens every other year. It happened November of last year, GridX 3, GridX 4 will be November of 2017. And in this last one, it grows every year or every time it happens, as you might imagine. Uh, there were, I think, 4,000 plus individuals involved, over 160 utilities. As I mentioned to Joe, almost every FBI field office in the country was involved. It's played at the state, local, federal uh, level. And uh, it gets as real as it can. It makes it real. I always talk about exercise as, as putting people in stress positions. Why do you exercise? You go in stress positions, you test yourself, you make mistakes, but at the end of the day, you're, you're stronger. And it, when you do it again, you'll be more ready for something that might happen in, in the real world. So GridX, you can, you can search for it. You can come back to me. I'm part of the planning committee for that exercise. I don't even want to show you the slide, but if you'll just look at the, the box on the right hand side, I, all this is is it, it, the, the box, the yellow circle part. It's proof that in that, this mighty complicated constellation of different organizations, government uh, and commercial that are involved in this exercise, uh, there is local, state, provincial government involved. Provincial meaning Canada is a big part of it as well. And there'll be a conference in November, uh, excuse me, it might be October, called Grid Sec. Con, G R I D S E C C O N, be in Quebec City, and it'll give you really good or folks you recommend get to it, um, help help get to it. It'll give them a really good dose of grid security issues, uh, uh, solutions, things you can do at the state level, and prime you for maximum benefit out of Grid X4, which will be coming around uh, late 2017, as I said. Last couple points, and then I'm then I'm done. Uh, Maybe we talk about these more in Q&A. There's interesting things happening in Kansas in terms of the way they've added cyber capabilities to their fusion center and their cooperation, collaboration with their FBI offices for cyber intelligence. I'm using them as a model at an upcoming workshop in Idaho and Utah uh, who themselves are trying to build state level capabilities, starting with things that are much more related to law enforcement in fusion centers, but moving towards things like lifelines, lifeline sector security, and certainly some cyber capabilities. I play uh, a part in the New York Rev, reforming the energy vision, 
which is a grid modernization program. We're trying to make sure that security is an integral part, appropriate amounts of security and privacy are integral parts of that initiative from the onset and not waiting till everything is deployed and then people go, oh no, it's too late, we, we need to add something. The, the time to do this is during the, during the initiative itself, not later on once you have a breach and realized you wish you had done it earlier. And lastly, California. CES 21 is California Energy Systems for the 21st century. They're doing some fantastic cutting edge uh, security research and development and ultimately deployment, um, primarily coming out of their PUC, driven by the, the CPUC, and uh, being enacted by the three large IOUs and other players in that ecosystem. So that's it. That's my email address. You can write to it. That's my Twitter ID. You can follow it. And uh, thank you for your time. Next up. Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Joe Demarest, Mr. Demarest, as uh, an executive director in the advisory services practice of Ernst & Young. His prior experience includes some of the most critical roles in the FBI and the Office of Global Security at Goldman Sachs & Company. He served as assistant director in charge of the FBI's New York field office, where he led the largest and most complex national security and criminal programs. He was also selected to take on the critical role of leading the cyber division and the director's priority next generation cyber initiative, an initiative to transform all aspects of the Bureau cyber program. Most recently, he served as associate executive assistant director to FBI's criminal cyber response and surveillance branch to the director's office, where he served as chief operations officer for the branch. Joe? Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you, Max, for uh, the uh, kind introduction. Um, I am now currently with Ernst & Young. I joined Ernst & Young uh, in their risk advisory practices uh, last year after spending 25 years with the FBI. Uh, last four years spent on overhauling the FBI's cyber operations, working closely with Director Mulley, then uh, and formerly, uh, or then uh, Director Comey uh, as well. Uh, today, uh, we thought in our planning uh, sessions uh, for this panel that I'd briefly go over the actors or the adversaries who are currently or have targeted uh, state entities, I'll say uh, the government sector, if you will, uh, public uh, service uh, groups, uh, and then followed on by a, a high-level overview of an anatomy of an attack. Actually, how does it unfold, who does what, and how does it occur? So if you look across the uh, top, we're talking about the, uh, the current state threats or those actors uh, who are looking at you as a potential victim. Um, if you look across the, the top, the bar in gold, we have the threat actors, the specific targets they're aiming for, the attack vectors, or how they actually go about doing what they do. Along the left bar on the uh, vertical, you see uh, the actor types, uh, nation state sponsored actors, cyber criminals, hacktivists, and we'll talk briefly about the insider threat. It's one of the highest rated threats uh, among industry today, or at least the most concerned to you know, our CIO and uh, CISO population um, and how they effectively deal with uh, the insider. So let's just start with the top, right? The most concerning uh, for some industries, uh, nation state uh, sponsored uh, actors. As you can see, they have cute names, uh, monikers that were given to them by either industry groups, government, uh, and it's based on, if you think about it, certain tactics, techniques, procedures, tools that these groups use and, and like in kind. And they're able to assemble these, these individuals or groups into uh, known entities that they can then track and see, in, in some cases, I'll say more, uh, more, more so for government, uh, across the internet and what they're involved in. Um, as you can probably imagine most of the actors are emanating out of Asia, Eurasia, and some we have found in the Middle East. So specific targeting, government entities, obviously uh, no one is exempt um, when it comes to targeting for political purposes or geopolitical purposes from afar. They're looking at critical infrastructures, uh, Andy mentioned. Um, energy companies are a big interest. Uh, transportation as well, which is not listed here. 
Uh, legislative uh, leaders, um, uh, state, local, uh, for, for some reason, uh, different groups are interested in what's happening. Uh, and you look at the Hill, uh, state, and, uh, or the, the House and the Senate as well, also a keen target. Um, anything you put in an email today, as you're seeing in our current political environment, uh, uh, it can be exposed. So what you put in writing, and it could be done for malicious purposes or intelligence purposes, by some of these nation state actors. So how do they go about doing it? So spear phishing email, those are those emails that are crafted and directed specifically at a target audience or an individual. So they will research you online, social media profile, um, what colleagues say about you, um, speaking events, any events that you attend or your staffs attend, um, what family and friends were posting about you on Facebook. Um, they'll use that to craft a, 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 a almost near perfect English uh, email that you'll receive and think it's from a colleague or someone that you recently met. You'll open it and then with an attachment or otherwise and then potentially expose your network. Uh, events malware and when we talk about zero day exploits, it's exploits or at least malware software for malicious purposes that has never been seen before. Actually created, technically created for that specific attack against that specific victim or entity. Um, and the last piece here is USB stick. So interesting cases across my time with the FBI where USB sticks were found sprinkled about parking lot areas or within waiting rooms of a given entity or outside of a DOD facility. And as you can imagine, right, staff, employees, you find something, it's shiny, it's nice, great. Uh, imagine taking that back and not even realizing what you're doing, right? And plugging it into your laptop, home laptop, or, you know, uh, your desktop. So moving on to cyber criminals, very advanced today and growing, right? The, the, it's it's little, little effort for tremendous gain from a, from a monetary standpoint. Um, as you look across uh, the, the globe today, mainly emanating out of Eastern uh, Europe, Central Europe, uh, Southeast Asia as well, we have this group of hackers for hire now, right? It's developing on the uh, dark net, and we'll talk more about that uh, maybe potentially during uh, Q&A. But people who are lending themselves out to the highest bidder to conduct whatever you'd like them to do from a technical standpoint. Um, interested in employee PII, you see a number of breaches today or accidental disclosures of our W-2s. You can imagine all the information that's contained in there. Uh, voter registration records, uh, uh, employee health and education records, driver's licenses and the like. What many of these groups do today, and we found in working with uh, the EY threat cyber, the threat uh, intelligence team, uh, there is groups now in the dark net that are aggregating all this information, creating profiles for you uh, in, as an individual from, you can imagine, right, your name, hopefully date of birth, SOC, driver's license information and the like, and they use that, right, and sell, right, and the more information they have on a complete bio, the more, more money they make on your record. Um, malicious documents, the way they get into you, so um, a large institution, advertising online for certain key positions, received an email, very well written, polished, uh, with an attached CV or resume. The resume was contained malware, um, malware in the form of ransomware, which completely locked up, as you can imagine, it stops or prevents you from accessing any of the files on your, your desktop or laptop, and then any share files and everything else in the, it completely traced back through all of their backups as well. So costing that organization quite a bit of money to, to bring in uh, a, re a remediation team and then eventually decided not to pay and rebuilt but lost almost three years worth of, worth of data. Spear phishing emails, which I've mentioned. Um, uh, unpatched vulnerabilities, which you'll find throughout networks today. We had a uh, company we were working with in the hundreds of thousands of known vulnerabilities, known published vulnerabilities that still existed in their particular network. Uh, hacktivists, and you can run through them from Anonymous to Lulzac, Lizard Squad, uh, and the others. There's, for some reason, they've decided there's a, a political or sociological issue that uh, they have uh, taken issue with, a specific organization or otherwise. And by the use of using botnets, which are web robots, where they enslave your machine or your computer 
uh, and then form these uh, robots, if you will, um, botnets, uh, consisting of hundreds of thousands to, um, we've seen them over a million infected computers to conduct different attacks. And, and the, the most common was the distributed denial of service attack. And that's really an attack of uh, these computers, all the enslaved computers, coming into your website and asking for information, basically. There was one, there was research that was done, it was on a, uh, I'll say a financial services company. Uh, there was a, a long uh, thesis paper on a particular country, and they came in and asked for that thousands of times per minute, and actually effectively bringing down a uh, financial services site. Lastly, the uh, insider threat, right? Two types, you've got your malicious, right, the kind we're most concerned about, and then the inadvertent, someone that opened something that it shouldn't have, someone who inadvertently plugged in, didn't follow security procedures, and plugged in that USB stick that they found at Starbucks or in the parking lot. Um, it's usually those who have been given access, right? Designated or uh, company access to, uh, is from uh, current employees, uh, contractors, and the like, and former folks who may still have access. Uh, they're looking for the sensitive information to either take, sell, or otherwise, or use in a way that embarrasses the company, right? Some internal communications and the like. Um, and we've seen right down to destruction of uh, certain systems as a result of uh, them being let go or there was some discussion about in taking some kind of uh, employee-related action uh, against them. So those are the actors. And those are the actors we have seen when in my time with the FBI and certainly now uh, working with industry uh, and in the government public services space we see that uh, you, you have uh, these groups of actors who are certainly focused on you and the importance of uh, cybersecurity today um, is no doubt something that we believe right, and have seen, certainly my time in government with EY, we're still at the very tip of the iceberg on what we're going to be doing as a country when it comes to cybersecurity. So uh, if you permit me, I'll run through the anatomy of a hack. We'll do this at a very high level. Um, and as you look at the graphic on your left, um, You'll see we'll have all the external actions that take place. Then on the right, the internal actions, right? Those are the things after they successfully have breached your networks. Um, the attack stages you see across the, the horizontal in the center, you have the groundwork, the engagement, the presence, and then the effect of the consequence of uh, what they do. So groundwork, first, all of them plan. There's some design around what they're going to do, short of those who just wake up in the morning and decide, let me just try to see who's vulnerable to this type of tool that I have or I plan to acquire. So there's a good bit of uh, planning that goes on. Uh, they conduct research on your company for whatever reasons. If, they're, if you're involved in some negotiations from a state perspective with certain entities external to your state, um, They'll develop the resources, right, to start doing the research on what tools, right, that are currently available they need to build to access uh, known vulnerabilities that you may have uh, in your uh, networks. Um, and then in this same phase, the initiate, and this is also where, you know, I, I mentioned the spear phishing and drafting and creating those. This is where all that's done in, the, in this part of it. On the engagement piece is when they release those, their spear phishing emails. Generally done, what we've seen in groups of three, three distinct groups within a company, within government, with three different types of topics so they're not caught, right? Once you defeat one, um, you generally can thwart the uh, ongoing or at least the, the remaining of the attack. Um, and it could be from topics related to current legislative efforts, it could be staffing, it could be, as I mentioned, uh, um, uh, someone applying for a position within, within government. Once in, so this is where they establish that foothold, in which you've, you've heard before, I'm sure. They establish that presence, right? And their idea in that is to hide, they do not want to get caught, then expand their view into your networks. This is where they do a lot of that searching for the important information that they're currently looking for or those juicy tidbits of data, right, employee records, uh, PII and the like, which they look to extract and, and uh, ultimately sell. Once in, they are looking to elevate or escalate privileges, right, to those administrators' accounts by compromising, right, a lot of times it's actually, they're found from the username and password for specific systems to widen their view throughout, throughout your networks. And then lastly, the effect, right? So what are they trying to do? Ransomware is denying access to certain files. 
uh, consuming resources, right? So they do take your computer over for different reasons to conduct a DDoS, a distributed denial of service attack, uh, or taking over components of your computer, right? Your desktop, your webcam, uh, and the like. We've seen multiple cases of that, the keystroke logging and the like. Extracting data, destroying uh, hardware, software, and the Sony attack. We worked very closely with Sony throughout that entire breach and what occurred there. Um, and then lastly, just enabled future operations uh, with them. With that, I know my time is over. Uh, let me just close with this. Uh, the cybersecurity environment is completely complex. There's no way of truly preventing every attack. It's just not going to happen. The actors are skilled, they're trained, financially uh, supported, uh, and they're patient. Uh, and they're not only targeting our uh, technical systems, but also our people and the processes we use for certain key functions within government today. So I look forward to uh, more discussion uh, during the Q&A session, and I will cede the floor. Thank you. Are we terrified yet? I'm not sure. <laughs> Our final speaker is Ashwini Jaral. Mr. Jaral currently serves as Director of Operations for the IJIS, the Aegis Institute. It was funded in 2001 as an integrated justice information system in response to U.S. Department of Justice's interest in raising private sector participation in the advancement of national initiatives affecting justice and public safety and homeland security. As a member of the prestigious Federal 100 in 2014, Mr. Jarrah was instrumental in conceiving and implementing a new standards-based interoperability program, also known as Springboard Certification Program, to help advance information sharing in the justice, public safety, and homeland security environments. His edu he, he educates mission and industry partners about the value of adopting interoperability standards and is currently leading a project interoperability initiative that will lead to the development of a national framework for government, industry, and other organizations facing challenges around information sharing, safeguarding, and interoperability. Ashwini? Thanks, Max. And I, trust me, I'm not going to talk about interoperability today. I'm going to share some thoughts about um, things that we have discovered as part of our uh, information sharing efforts around safeguarding and especially around cybersecurity in the law enforcement community. So uh, let me start with actually sharing a chart with you which actually depicts how as a human we actually adapt to a technology and how as an organization we adapt and then where the policy sits in that adaption. So um, as we all know that technology is moving at very fast pace. Innovation takes its, its place on a daily basis. We are getting a lot of new tools, new technology. And humans are uh, behind that curve adapting. So we're very good when a new technology comes in, we go and buy it because we want the latest and greatest gadget. We want the latest technology. But as an organization, uh, we are way behind in adopting the technology, bringing the technology into our mission to help us in our operations. And policies are way behind that curve because uh, quite often when we go and buy these technologies and make an investment, we don't think about the policy. I know that uh, Andy and Joe talked about some of the security and privacy concerns. Quite often we forget that policy is the heart as we move forward in adopting um, technology. And hence, the cyber threat that exists out there has a technology component, but above all, it has the policy component. So we have a huge gap today between the technology innovation and the policy, and we have to figure out a way if we are going to collectively, as a community, trying to address some of the cyber threats, we have to bridge that gap from technology to policy. So law enforcement. This is a, I know it's a busy chart, but this is just to depict the complexity of how on daily basis a law enforcement agency or an official within a law enforcement entity interacts with different systems. This chart actually shows, and it's not even up to date, this was done last month, we have discovered 36 different interactions that a law enforcement agency can have with different mission partners on a daily basis. So what that means, 36 ways of actually compromising your system, getting into your technology, data assets, and as we get more connected, that also means high risk. So we live in a connected world. We all are carrying different devices. We're connecting to different information assets. So what we're doing is increasing our risk and opening the gates 
for the hackers to get into the system if we don't do anything around policy, but also, above all, making an investment in the technology that can help us solve some of those challenges. This is a chart that shows a, just a snapshot from 2006 to 2014 about the federal agencies actually who reported the number of hacks. And you can see that it's on a rise. In 2006, there was only 5,500 um, incidents reported for the federal agencies. And in 2014, it's almost at 67,000. And this is not even the complete data set because we don't have all the information. This is purely based on what was uh, self-reported by the federal agencies. So what are some of the cyber threats um, our law enforcement agencies are facing? I know Joe touched on some of those. Uh, we live in an environment where public safety agencies are at the higher risk. In uh, government agencies, law enforcement is at the higher risk. Uh, today, the challenges that our law enforcement agencies face is that hackers are defacing the website, getting the data, publicizing it on the web, attacking our court system, our police departments, getting the data, locking it, encrypting, encrypting it, and asking for the ransomware. Some of the threat observations, these are some of the type of attacks. I know that um, Joe talked about ransomware. These are different types of uh, attacks that request, once they encrypt your um, information or the files or your computer, uh, that you have to pay to recover those files. And what we discovered as part of our analysis that agencies whose systems were compromised, that close to 19.4% were able to actually restore the data from the backup. But the sad story is that 22.6% actually ended up paying the ransom to recover that data because they did not have any backup. And then above all, 58% actually lost the data because they did, refused to pay the ransomware or they did not have the uh, actual way to backup because they were not negotiating that with their solution provider or did not have any uh, program in place within their agency to actually back up their data on daily basis. So they ended up losing the data. So what does this tell us? The victim, anybody sitting in this room or out there in our government offices can be attacked and can be a victim. But what we lack is a good metrics because today it's hard for us to tell us how big this problem is because most of the incidents are self-reported and sometimes we don't even know that our systems have been compromised and it might be a few months, a few days before we even realize that our systems have been compromised. So, Bottom line, that we are unprepared. We need to do a whole lot to actually protect our uh, data assets and make it a priority that as we are collecting the data, as we are moving into the digital world, we have to do a lot more from policy to technology to address these challenges. There was a study that was done by International Association of Chiefs of Police and National White Collar Crime Center between 2013 to 2015. And the observations this study actually made were that most of the law enforcement agencies were aware of these threats. They knew uh, what the consequences will be if their system is compromised, but they did not put the risk management framework in place to manage this risk, to be responsive to this risk, to be proactive. And some of the things that we discovered, the challenges that were shared as part of this study, that quite often they did not have control of their infrastructure. It was managed by some other IT department, so they didn't even know what was going on. Uh, they don't have uh, resources to bring the skills to actually address some of these challenges. And especially with the budget shortfalls, everybody's trying to do a lot of things, and this is not a high priority. And so what this tells us, that we are not prepared to respond to the incidents, and quite often uh, we did a study on before and after with ISCP, and what we discovered, that not a whole lot of change even after the systems were compromised because these agencies don't have the resources to bring the skill set and procure a technology to address some of these cyber threats. This is a snapshot of data that was published uh, by Open Security Foundation in 2014. We all are here, consumers, and in 2014, over a billion consumer records were compromised. And some of the ways the uh, data was compromised was by using some of the services like taxi and limousines, where we use our credit card doing online transaction e-commerce because we did not look if the site can be trusted. We used put our information. Um, credit Bureau, we think it's safe, but again, they were compromised. And we all know in 2014, Target hack, Home Depot, 
So we know that even the big organizations are struggling with this problem. So that sets the stage for even law enforcement agencies that we have long ways to go to address this problem. Some of the things that we are doing nationally from cybersecurity, it is a policy issue. We have to do something around the policy. So White House uh, issued an executive order and a presidential policy directive, and these are some of the examples around critical infrastructure. So what we need to do is take some of these lessons learned and some of the policies and figure out how our states and counties and cities can actually leverage these policies to come up with a policy framework to address some of the cyber threats. What we need? is a risk management framework. We need to manage this as a risk like any other business. Uh, we need to figure out, hackers are very smart. They are uh, figuring out a better way and faster way to hack our system. So we need to be uh, prepared how we respond and stop that hack once they're in at a machine speed level. And we need to do a better job of protecting our infrastructure. So from strategy perspective that we're working with the chiefs of police uh, across the country and across the world is that we need to keep this message simple. Uh, we need to talk in a mission context. We need to work with the executives to understand how deep this problem is. We need to educate them. We need to uh, come up with a model policy that we can collectively work and address some of the challenges that our state and locals face. And above all, it's about the collaboration. It's about the partnership. It is a partnership where government and industry needs to collaborate and work together to fight this cyber threat issue because industry is definitely ahead of the curve to do this. Thanks. Thank you for your uh, really solid presentations here. Uh, I think you probably scared us a little bit here, but that's kind of the point, isn't it? Um, I'm wondering if people have questions, and if you come to the mic and provide the, your question for the panel, that would be great. And please start with your uh, name and state. Thank you very much, and thank you, panelists, for an excellent presentation from all three of you. I'm Senator Susan Lee from the state of Maryland. Uh, we currently have a Cybersecurity Council in place, but I wanted to ask you all, do you, uh, and perhaps the first speaker could address this, uh, this issue dealing with an integrated cyber response for critical infrastructures, whether or not we're having a collaboration between the federal government and states because uh, when, when uh, hackers attack our infrastructures, such as our power grids, do we have some kind of uh, partnership between our feds and states in terms of responding? Because it, it goes across borders. And do this, uh, do, has you been your experience where the states are cooperating with you with respect and also to law enforcement, in terms of best practices, protocols, and uh, just taking risk assessments and advising us states on what we wanted to do. And respect to the third speaker, thank you so much. You identify the problem very well. I was wondering whether or not the private industry has embraced the NIST cybersecurity framework, because it is truly voluntary. But have you seen it on a national level, many of the industries addressing this issue? All right, thank you for those uh, great questions, and uh, I'm going to try to give you a selected response uh, to, to, to part of it, and then Ashwini will take over. Um, in terms of uh, collaboration between the state, state level folks and federal on cybersecurity issues, particularly as pertain to critical infrastructure, which DHS defines, they have 16 or 17 different uh, sectors now that are so classified, and I saw an article yesterday that said, um, it would be helpful if voting machines now became part of critical infrastructure so the DHS could play a more meaningful role in this very interesting time in which we live. I don't know if that will happen. I don't know if that will help. Back to the point, uh, question at hand. Uh, um, since my focus area is so much on the electric sector, I'll mainly speak to that but allow you to infer uh, that most of what I say for electric sector applies to, if not all those different critical infrastructure sectors, then at least to the lifeline sectors, which again, if you're not familiar with that term, are electric, oil, natural gas, water and wastewater, and transportation, and I think uh, also communications, okay? So even that subset of critical infrastructure is still incredibly huge and, and unwieldy and hard to deal with. Two places I would point you, state of Maryland and other states, to uh, have best access, best interactions with uh, folks that are on the 
the, the borderlands between the states and federal. Um, first, let's go to the E-ISAC. Uh, it used to be called the ESISAC, but just to keep you on your toes, they got rid of one of the letters. So now it's Electricity Information Sharing and Analysis Center. It's part of NERC, but it's also completely separate from NERC uh, in that you can interact with them, utilities and PUCs and state government can interact with them. And from the utilities point of view, um, there's no threat that things that are discovered through conversations will in any way impact them from uh, the NERC SIP standards that I told you uh, that, that some of you are familiar with, the mandatory security standards for the bulk electric system. So I'd advise you to, to look up and establish some rapport with EISAC. If you're shy or nervous and you'd like an introduction, I'd be happy to make that introduction. The second uh, organization I'd recommend to get at some of the things you're seeking uh, is NERIC. Y'all are familiar with NERIC, uh, right? Um, that's the North American, and I sometimes screw up acronyms, um, Regional Utility Commissions, it's basically, or Council, it's the uh, Washington base of all the public utility commissions. So these are the folks responsible in your state for, jurist, for oversight uh, of electric and other uh, critical infrastructure sectors, uh, primarily distribution level, as I said from the Ukraine example, utilities. And uh, there's a gentleman who runs their security program na named Miles Keogh. K-E-O-G-H, he's a very interesting person, uh, also very smart and uh, well-connected in Washington. So Miles will be happy to uh, entertain your questions and grab you by the hand and lead you in directions that might be fruitful. I'd recommend if you or the folks that you charge with following security matters, particularly grid-related in your state are interested, uh, NARIC has a critical infrastructure subcommittee that meets regularly, that has teleconferences, that I've spoken, uh, I've, I've briefed um, multiple times, and that's a great fire hose for you. And I'll leave it, I'll leave off there. So uh, from the private sector, yes, they're definitely collaborating, and one of the great examples that we always love to talk about is the financial sector. Uh, financial sector has done a great job of standing up information analysis center, also known as FSI SAC. We're learning a lot from them because financial sector has a motivation because they don't want to lose the revenue and get the bad reputation because there will be a financial implications on their business. So as such, a lot of the technology companies are also now forming a partnership and collaborating and keeping their competitive edge on the side and getting together to form the information sharing analysis center around cyber threat. So right now, uh, we are making uh, progress, but it's slow even in the private sector. We're sharing information, and one of the thought processes is that we, more we can share about these threats, and even if it's anonymously, uh, we're still uh, serving each other and helping each other in this fight against cyber crime. So as such, uh, for example, Microsoft, Symantec, and these guys are actually have also formed a partnership. And the biggest thing that we have learned is that sometime uh, these companies actually also uh, come under the radar from, for sharing too much. So one of the big uh, thing that they're looking at is how we can share this information and serve the purpose but also uh, not lose our competitive edge. So there are a lot of partnerships out there, but FSI SAC is one of the great examples where financial sector has done a great job of sharing information among the financial industry. Say that again, please. If you could come to the mic, Senator, that would be good because we are live here. Thank you. This is just a follow-up. Do you think that CISA has assisted the private industry with respect to information sharing, you know, cybersecurity information? Yes. The, the Sharing Act that just yes. passed by Congress. Yes. I know it's just been about probably less than a year, it's, it, but it, was it something that you all embraced too in the private sector? Yes, we do. And the thing is that we're also leveraging that because uh, we uh, tend not to talk a lot about standards, but we do are also working on leveraging and through that partnership, also creating what we are calling a common language, how to share these cyber threats and the information that we can share with each other. Uh, because quite often we also find ourselves that we use different terminology and it confuses the world, and so we decide not to share that. So we're actually working collaboratively on that. All right, thank you. Andy, did you? All right, um, are there, if there are no more questions, we have a couple recommendations. Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Kurt McCormick, representative from Vermont. Um, at the risk of sounding like a Luddite, uh, I, th I think in our, um, uh, in our culture, um, anything that's electronic is considered better. And we keep doing things that we used to do in another way. We now do it electronically. We're literally voting with our telephones now instead of just raising our hands. And the assumption is that's better, I think, because it's electronic. And that's not to say we don't need electronics, and electronics do some great things. I, I'm thinking of a, a horrible uh, plane collision over Europe where the uh, air traffic controller overruled the computer, and he was wrong. The computer was right. Um, so uh, I'm really not a Luddite, but I do think we are so dependent on computers now, and we don't need to be. So I asked this question of Ted Koppel the other day, and I want to ask it of probably you, Andrew. Um, uh, it wasn't that long ago that we were not using a whole lot of computers to, um, to wheel power around the country. And um, we uh, now apparently are completely dependent on it. So if it gets hacked, um, we're in big trouble. And uh, Koppel actually explained how in the Ukraine they got out of that and got back up pretty quickly thanks to the fact that they were not so electronic dependent. Can't we, in the case of our electric utilities, which might be the most important uh, thing to pay attention to, can't we at least get back to and mandate that utilities have manual systems and protocol always ready on a moment's notice to bypass the computer. Instead of the computer bypassing humans throwing switches, shouldn't we have it, shouldn't we mandate that utilities have to have a manual hand operated switch protocol for um, wheeling power, like just like we used to, and apparently like Ukraine does today, and I think probably most certainly most um, developing countries still do today. Andy, you want to take that? Uh, before I start, um, are we hard stop at 10.30? Do you That's know, correct. Max? Hard stop at 10.30. What time is it now? It's 10.27. <laughs> Sorry. Sir from Vermont, uh, to be completely honest with you, you're, you're right on in a lot of ways. And uh, to fully unpack and give you a very satisfying answer, which I think uh, we can maybe talk afterwards, uh, keeping it down to 30 seconds or so. Um, a recent Senate hearing called S3018, uh, recent meaning, last couple of weeks, was on this topic. Lessons learned from Ukraine, restored much faster because they had only recently started to significantly digitize their control of their control systems. And so the personnel who were used to doing it in a more manual fashion were still there. They hadn't been let go for efficiency reasons. Uh, they hadn't been completely replaced by automation. And this is a big feather in their cap. Um, so your point is well taken, but there are some things that I would have to say to you about uh, how the US is much different than that. And it will be highly non-trivial to start to move in that direction. Um, I, I like that you said uh, you sound like a Luddite, you know, or the risk of sounding like a Luddite. On my uh, profile on Twitter, I say I'm a selective Luddite for certain things. That uh, attitude and that opinion is extremely appropriate these days. And how to get there is, uh, is the magic trick. I'll stop. Right. Thanks. All right. And I, I think part of what happens is that a lot of our systems were designed initially without security in mind. So we've got email systems. We've got an internet which did not have security at a rock solid basis. And it's going to take some work to, to get that back up. Uh, all right. Well, let's thank the panel th for your consideration. I think they'll be around for a few minutes. And thank you all for coming. All right.